participants, and I anticipate that we'll have more. It is my pleasure to introduce Avi. Avi Sanko is an industrial engineering, um, is in industrial engineering. She'll be graduating soon. Uh, it is fantastic to know that on her Facebook page, her mission is bridging technology and nonprofits. Uh, she is pretty accomplished in her own right, uh, being an Edison scholar and more. Uh, so without further ado, Avi, would you introduce our keynote tonight? Absolutely, thank you for the introduction, Victoria. Hello everyone, I hope you have all been doing well, that break was restful, and that you have all been keeping healthy despite all the craziness going on. Uh, my name is Avi Sanko, and I am a second year studying industrial engineering and operations research and minoring in global poverty and practice. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Tracy Young, whose accomplishments and backgrounds inspire and speak to me, especially as a woman of color in engineering. Tracy is the CEO and co-founder of PlanGrid, a construction product productivity software used to deliver real-time project information. Her software was recently acquired by Autodesk for 875 million. 875 million. I'll say it again. Just a little <laughs> less than one billion dollars. <laughs> exactly. And before founding PlanGrid in 2011, Tracy graduated from Cal State University Sacramento in 2007 with a bachelor's in engineering management. After graduating, she joined Rudolph and Sutton as a project engineer, where she managed trades and BIM coordination, as well as construction on a hospital project. She also managed medical equi equipment, DFH, and casework on a medical office building construction project. In her process of founding PlanGrid, she was a member of W12 cohort within Y Combinator and shared her entrepreneurial vision throughout her journey. And according to Tracy, she said, I poured my heart and soul in and loved it completely. And so without further ado, I present to you, Tracy Young. Tracy, thank you for joining us. I am going to uh, spotlight you right now. And because you are in the spotlight, uh, thank you for joining us. So I, as, as Unfortunately, our, our students know, or, or fortunately, I'm just starting to get used to using these webinars, but I'm curious, I know you've spoken in a lot of different uh, forums. Have you spoken on a webinar? Yeah, I've spoken on a few webinars. Is there anything that uh, you want us to keep in mind as we're going through this tonight? No. <laughs> uh, and you're joining us from, uh, let's see, I think, uh, Evie is down in, uh, Car is it Carson? Yeah, I'm down in Carson, which is like Southeast Los Angeles, the greater LA area. You're in Marin right now, Tracy. I'm in the East Bay. And I think we have students as far as, um, I mean, we have people in India and, and hopefully in China joining us also. So it's, uh, we're all over the place. It's kind of fun. Um, so right off the bat, I wanted to ask you some, about something that you probably have in common with a number of students who are in the audience. Um, yes, of course, you're a woman, but actually you're a first generation um, uh, being in this country. And I wanted to know if you could talk about that a little bit. And I actually have some, uh, a slide that I wanted to share as you start to talk. Yeah. Um... My parents were refugees of the Vietnam War, and I was incredibly lucky to be the first person in my family to be born in, in the United States. Um, but they went through horrors that I will never have to go through, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. I mean, my parents and my sister, my older sister, they, like, wherever the line was for homelessness, they were always above that, but they were always like barely above that. And so what that meant was my, both my parents worked two jobs around the clock and on weekends to make everything work so that we could have the opportunities that, you know, we have, my brother and I and my sister. So Tracy, right now I'm sharing this picture of a ton of people on a boat. Yes, I don't see that photo, but I know which one um, you're talking about. Yeah, my, my parents are on that boat with their toddler, my sister at the time, which is crazy. And that's just how you escape communism in late 1970s. So they came over in the 70s, working parents. Um, 
you were obviously a high school student and uh, tell us a little bit about what you had decided to do as you started um, thinking about colleges and obviously our audience is in college. Um, it was kind of interesting. I, I always, um, <laughs> uh, it's obviously we have a bunch of Cal students and you have kind of an interesting story about Cal. So if you'd share that with us. My interesting story about Cal, I, I applied to Cal and got rejected. I was completely bummed out because I loved Berkeley so much. I ended up um, living in Berkeley and Oakland for many years as an adult um, after I graduated. But I was, I was never like number one in anything. I was an above average student. Maybe like the best I did was 10th place. Um, and I just wasn't, I don't know, my parents were busy. My parents were busy working. I mean, it was like, it was a privilege for us to go to any school. And so I went to the only other college I applied to, which was California State University, Sacramento. And they were incredibly good to me. I got a great education there. They paid for more than half of it. And um, I came out of school and worked in construction. I knew I wanted to be a builder. I actually was hoping I would get into Cal's architectural program, which ended up being a really good thing for my life. Um, given there wasn't an architectural program at Cal State Sacramento. And so I went into civil engineering and there's really two branches I could choose at the time um, out of the civil engineering department. And that was a, being a structural engineer or being a construction engineer. And it was obvious to me that the math should work. And so that would be the rest of my career um, being a, a structural engineer. Uh, behind a desk crunching numbers, or I could choose to be on a construction site and being part of the built process, and that's what I decided to do. So right out of college, I joined a general contracting firm building hospitals in 2007. So um, <laughs> you do appear somewhat demure, and, and I imagine you tend to be maybe a little more introverted how the heck did that work with you on a construction site? I stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I'm going to share a, quickly share a picture again. Uh, there we go. That's you. I, I think it's you with the hard hat on with this Mustang uh, machine behind you, basically. I think that's what it's called. So funny funny thing about this photo is that safety vest is no longer OSHA approved. There needs to be, um, it's an old vest when I was in the field from 2007 to 2011. Now I think you have to have a lot more reflective material on your vest. And given I'm very petite, um, there actually isn't enough surface area on that vest. I could literally cover it with 100% reflective material and there still wouldn't be enough to satisfy the requirements. Wow. And so what was it like? What were your, like, how, how did, I mean, did they accept you? What did you feel like when you were on those sites? Oh, I was really lucky. I mean, I've been in the construction industry. I mean, I, I count even working in technology and software because we, we were building software for the construction industry. I still count that time the last eight years as working for this industry. And you hear a lot of stories about just being treated poorly. And that was never my experience. Um, I was incredibly lucky. I think it's, it's something about being in the Bay Area. I only worked on job sites in the Bay Area. And it's just, it's just a different culture out here. I think and the only thing my colleagues cared about was like, uh, was I going to work hard? And was I going to solve problems with them? They can didn't you describe some out. of the problems that you had to solve. Yeah, so architects design the structures and then construction engineers and general contractors translate the designs into physical structures. And so part of our jobs was one to figure out all the technical problems of what is buildable, what is not buildable, um, price it all out, find all the people who were going to do the work um, and then build it and then make sure it passes inspections and then turning it over to the building owner. Interesting. So we're going to talk about your ideation, your idea, but I actually already have two questions. So I'm going to ask, um, uh, is it Sneha to talk? We'll see if, uh, Sneha, I think this will work. Promote to panelist. 
Can you see us, Sneha? I guess, let me see if I can do that. And it's also, uh, let's see if I can, aha, Advait, that I can do. So Advait Marathe, do you wanna talk? Now, maybe you can even put your video on so we can see you. Um, I'm not sure how to put my video on right now. Okay, then it's kind talk of away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I guess, what do you think was the biggest challenge when coming, like, when trying to figure out, or like, sorry, what do you think the biggest challenge was, like, right after you got out of college, and you were trying to decide what to do? Like, did you have the job lined up in your senior year of college? Or like, did you, you know, start applying afterwards? Yeah, I, I did several co-ops in college. And um, the job I, I had right after university, I had already been working full time and it was sort of by design. Um, what was the challenge of choosing? I think it was, it was for my major, at least it was very obvious what, what I would end up doing. I would end up on a construction site working as an engineer. Did you, uh, how did you, did they get, have jobs interview sessions through Cal, um, excuse me, through at Sac State or did you, have to send resumes? How did that work? Um, so you, you have to understand like this is 2005, 2006, 2007 um, in Sacramento at the time and actually all over the Bay Area. We were just building like crazy. That was before that last downturn. And so yeah. there was a shortage of technical workforce who could help on these job sites. and. Um, there was there was just an oversupply of internships. I think, I think yeah, the advice like the advice I give you guys is just like optimize optimize for what you could potentially learn and who you can learn from versus any brand names. Um, in the end, as you find full time jobs or look for a transition into other companies. Like, it doesn't matter what your title was. It doesn't matter. Actually, yeah, title doesn't matter. Just nothing matters other than like, what did you learn and what did you help build in your last thing? And even if you're not working for anyone, like build your own thing, whatever it might be, work on your own projects. That matters too. And this is like, this is coming from, from a founder who built a company of 450 people. I mean, we did thousands of interviews and hired probably close to close to a thousand or more than that over the last eight years. We'll we'll talk about your hiring in a minute. I have another question from Daniel. Do you, do you want to go on, Daniel? Daniel, per, uh, Daniel Perez Lopez. You guys can type the questions. I'm happy to read them out loud. If that's easier. Uh, that can work also. Uh, I'm going to just ask uh, Guillermo if he wants to talk. Allow to talk. All right. Well, we're going to keep on going because I don't hear anybody asking Hello. questions. Ah, Guillermo. Sorry. Yeah, it didn't mute me really quick. Hello, Tracy. I'm curious. Uh, what was the transition in the actually starting plan grid? how did you decide what people to work with uh, i read that you start with four friends and some people say it never mix business with family and friends so i'm, I'm curious on what was the beginning of playing grid like and what were you thinking were you anxious were you young um and then i guess the following steps after that you're still young um th actually that's a fantastic segue we we're gonna uh, talk about that. So maybe you can talk about how you went from being on this construction site to starting to think about something that was an iPad based, I think. Yeah, so I was hired as empl employee number 1000 probably in 2007 at this general contracting firm. And then right after that, um, we saw mass layoffs. We were going through a downturn, 2008, 2009, 2000. 10, um, the construction industry, especially we saw 
the highest unemployment rates. It was really hard for a lot of people. People who had given 20, 30 years to this company were suddenly found without work. And it's funny because I thought I was such a great engineer, but it turned out it was just one of the cheapest engineers on payroll. And so I survived the next five years um, with the company. And it was really depressing because by, by 2011, I think we were down to like 300 employees. And so you can imagine like what it felt like to see 700 people get laid off. Um, and I think by that time, uh, my, my co-founder and I, who also worked in construction, who was actually a, a Cal student, um, uh, we were just jaded, I think. We just, it was depressing to be a part of that industry at the time. And we also saw so many inefficiencies and so Plan Grid started off as just a fun project. We were, we were all engineers. We were two construction engineers and three software engineers. And we were all friends. Um, three of us had gone to university together. Two of us had worked together professionally. And two of us were dating at the time, now married with kids. Um, and we just wanted to not go to work and work on a fun project together. <laughs> And I think that's how startups should start because the moment, the moment you take funding, the moment you take outside capital, there's just so much pressure to make certain decisions like get a return on that investment as fast as possible um, that it makes it not fun and it makes it harder to be creative about what you're inventing and the problem you're solving. So, so for a long time, it was just it was just a fun project. We weren't doing it to build a company. We were doing it to solve a problem that two of us experienced in the field. What? How would you articulate what that problem was? Yeah. So Steve Jobs announces the first generation iPad in 2010, and my co-founders and I looked at each other and we thought, "Wow, this is like the first time we could take a fully powered computer out onto a job site." which wasn't run by any software. I mean, the, like the fanciest things we were doing in terms of technology on a job site um, was have this incredibly heavy tablet PC uh, with Microsoft Excel loaded on it just so we didn't have to write stuff down on pen and paper. Instead, we were typing it in the field. And these things had a battery life that didn't last that long and they were about seven pounds. And so it, it didn't work. Um, and so for us, we were incredibly lucky. We benefited from timing. <laughs> it's like a, we were just the first ones who decided to write software, uh, iOS software for the first generation iPad. And, and in, in its most basic form, PlanGrid just digitized the construction record set. Did you think about, so you had this group of the, the five of you, um, I think it was five. Did you think about other ideas or was it, you knew that that was the idea? I mean, it sounded like you all were friends. You were, you know, just throwing around maybe different ideas. Did that happen? Or, I mean, it does sound like it was fortuitous. You had this iPad, you could do something with it, but did you come up with any other crazy ideas that you might've done instead or were just throwing around? Yeah, my, my co-founder, Ryan, um, the other construction engineer, he has tons of ideas. I mean, I met him when I was 18 and we went to university together and he must have pitched me like hundreds of ideas over the six years I knew him before founding a company together. I think he, he grew up in the Bay Area and had just always knew he was going to be a founder of something. <laughs> and I think Plangard was the first thing he pitched me where... I thought, yeah, I think, I think we could be the ones to solve this problem. So you had somebody who seems entrepreneurial on the team. Is he the only one who kind of was what I would consider somewhat entrepreneurial, the idea guy? I think so. Ryan was the idea guy. And um, I mean, all of us are builders, uh, whether it's buildings or software. That's so, what we'd like to do. So when you're starting a company and it sounds absolutely like it makes sense, you have this iPad, you have this incredible need, um, you have Ryan who's basically on his hundredth idea and he's like, he knows it's going to work. There's a huge gap between 
what you think as engineers and building an idea and how are you going to make it relevant to people who need the product? Um, you need a good story. Um, how did you, what was the story and how did you all create that story? Yeah, it was helpful that two of us had been in the industry for five years. So we got to see firsthand the problem and I mean, paper just sucks. I think everyone knows that. Um, and it especially sucks on a construction site um, for many reasons. One, there's a lot of paper and the paper blueprints are incredibly large. They're 36 inches by 42 inches. And there's a lot of versions of them. I mean, on the hospital project I was on, there was like 5,000 sheets for the initial set. And any given week, 50 new pages would come out. Um, because you can imagine one wall moves and suddenly it's like a domino effect, the whole floor plan changes. And so version control was a massive problem. And um, how did we sell the story? We would, we would paint the problem very clearly for anyone that we wanted to understand it, whether it was investors, whether it was new team members that we wanted to join our team. Um, we would, it was nice that we had a prop because it's easy to just like throw down 20 pounds of paper in front of someone, you know, stack of blueprints. And then say, well, instead of this, you know, this is what we're building. Um, and so that was sort of that very visual story we would tell investors. And it was nice because we could succinctly help them understand exactly the problem we were solving in a matter of a minute. I think I have a picture of uh, you with uh, some of your founders maybe talking to uh, or, or pitching to investors. I'm not sure if that's what they're doing. Um, it's yeah. with sporting bangs, I think. Yeah. So this is, this is November, 2011. We were in Mountain View at Y Combinator and Jessica Livingston or Paul Graham took that photo. And, and what, tell, what, what was that? Uh, I see a lot of paper there. In fact, I see a huge stack of paper to the person to your right. Um, yeah, yeah. So you can see the blueprints and you can also see an iPad in lime green. Oh yeah. So what was that like? So when, at what point did you go to Y Combinator? Because then you were accepted at Y Combinator. Yep. So I don't know, maybe like 30 minutes after that interview, we get a phone call from Paul Graham letting us know that we had been accepted into YC, um, winter 2012 batch. So when I'm looking at this, I want to kind of know on that picture where Alan is, is he in that picture? Oh, who's Ryan? I mean, Ryan, not Alan. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely in that picture. Can you show it to me again? Yep, absolutely. But a, a face to the ideas. Ryan, Ryan is wonderful. He's one of my best friends. So he, yeah. He's, he's the one next to me with shorter hair. All right. The one who's smiling because he's so excited. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. And, and can I, we, and when we look at this, who's the person, who's the person in the plaid shirt and, and yeah. That is my partner in everything. Uh, my co-founder and husband, Ralph. Fantastic. And then who is the numbers the guy who looks like the numbers guy with the glasses? Yeah, he's, he's, he's a, he's actually a math major also. Um, oh. That is Antoine, my other co-founder. Oh, fantastic. And so how, when you did this pitch, um, I guess we often think of people standing up and doing this presentation and having a PowerPoint. It doesn't look like you did that. No, no, the Y Combinator pitches um, are only 10 minutes. <laughs> it goes by incredibly fast. And how did you, why were you like, did you go to Y Combinator before you got funding or was that, uh, or after you got some funding? At what stage do you, make a decision to maybe go to uh, an incubator or accelerator. Yeah, we had nothing at that point. No, actually that's not true. We probably had a prototype that the team hacked together. It was, wasn't very good. Um, we certainly had no revenue at that point. Okay. Um, we just went in as a team and we convinced some that this industry needs software and we could be the ones that build it. So you said this is 2011. When did you start getting revenue? How did that, when, when did that happen and how did that happen? March, 2012. Within a year? 
Yeah, it was before demo day. So the y YC program is only three months long. And by the three months, we had revenue. And how how did that happen? Who did you sell into? What happened? What, how did that work? The first okay. first 20 customers of ours were people we had worked with in the field um, or people we had gone through university with. So they were all our friends. Um, but they wouldn't have paid us unless we had built something that they wanted. We were just incredibly lucky that they tried out our thing and helped us iterate until it was something they'd be willing to pay for. And with so there happened to be four people on the team right there, but with your partners, how did you divide the work? Who did what to help facilitate the sale? Yeah, and I think this is important, a clear delineation of responsibilities. Um, one person was in charge of the mobile platforms. One person was in charge of infrastructure and web. The other person was in charge of everything legal and anything operations related and HR related. Another person was in charge of all things sales and customer facing. Um, we just had our clear swim lane so that we could keep running and everyone was sort of versed enough where we could pitch in when someone needed help. What was your swim lane? My swim lane early on was sales, actually. That is so interesting. Um, what was your secret weapon for sales, you think? Uh, that I wasn't a salesperson. I went in very confident about what we had built and I was never selling to anyone. I was helping them. And I think that, I think that that came through. I think that's actually the secret of a good salesperson is figuring out how you can help someone. Uh, so that it was, was helpful that I had done their job and I knew exactly why it was painful and why it hurt and why our thing was going to help them. Do you remember if you, when you were creating the product, if you talked to different people in the field and tried different things out, like, did you, how much customer feedback did you get on what you were creating? Oh yeah, we were, we were talking to customers all the time. Um, I guess the construction engineers were always working on product as well. Um, yeah, we were talking to customers all the time. If we weren't on their job sites watching them, we were on the phone with them constantly. Fantastic. And so that's who you have. Who do you sell into when you're doing that? I mean, it's, uh, is there a, a, a group, a trade group that represents construction? I mean, how, how, who, how do you know who you're selling? I mean, yeah, I, I think what we got right um, early on was we so fully understood how money flowed through construction companies, mm -hmm. specifically construction projects. Um, we knew which budget line item that people could potentially pay for Plangard with. We know exactly who had credit cards where they could just make a $500 credit card swipe online and, and get under the radars of, of CIOs and IT departments. Yeah. Um, we knew exactly how they could expend something like Plangrid directly to their building owners. And so understanding how money flowed was probably incredibly powerful to our ability to getting to our first million in revenue. So I have a, uh, another photo here of, of, uh, of the iPad in the field uh, that I wanted to share as well. Let me get there really quickly. There we go. And let me share the screen so we can see that. Um, and so this is you. No, it's not you. Um, at least I don't think it's you. Um, I don't know if you can see it or not. Somebody's using the iPad. I think we see your desktop. Oh, fantastic. Glad you see that desktop. So let me stop that for a moment. <laughs> Maybe you could like create something that would uh, work for this too. Uh, let me see. Let me try that one more time. Does that seem any better? No, it's still like on spotlight view, I think. Ah. There you go. Huh. So that was the beauty of app store distribution, which was new to enterprises, to businesses. Um, IT departments and CIOs were the ones buying software and really the only software decisions they were making at the time was like, how much am I going to negotiate Microsoft down this year? Um, or which HR people software ERP system I'm going to use for the company. 
um, construction software didn't really exist. There was project management software where they would track costs, but this, you know, they would select one of the, one of the vendors and there's like, I don't know, 20 of them um, that sort of did the same thing because they were databases for, for cost. Um, and it wasn't really used by people in the field where like 95% of the people were working. And so we put a, the stake in the ground and we said, we're going to build software for the people in hard hats and safety boots. And this is the time for it because the, the hardware was just invented. The cloud exists, there's mobile devices now, and um, we would like to be the software developers for these two things. So it is pretty incredible that um, you hear stories about people who have to start so many, so, so many different projects. They're never successful. This was your first project. Yeah, we're, we're, we are so lucky. We, we, again, we benefited from timing. Yeah, there is something about timing, but uh, it's, it's interesting because you went to a space that people um, didn't think maybe needed to have any change. Um, and and uh, I don't know, I, I just think it's more than just timing. And not only was there timing, but I have some pictures that I'm hoping to share of a planned grid conference that you all had. Um, I don't know if you would be okay. Uh, I'm gonna try, let me try this one more time. Um, so can you just like, what is a planned grid conference? What was that? Yeah, so um, we had our conference, our first conference in 2018. Um, any chance you can see that? Yeah, I can see that. That is the only photo I have of my first pregnancy with my with my now toddler. Um, That's a great photo. You are quite my, pregnant. In fact, it looks like you're almost done there. <laughs> my I went into labor that night, um, which was great because I needed to give that keynote on stage. Um, you get to a certain size, and then just it's it's really hard to visit all our customers um, across the globe. And so we have a conference where we invite everyone in and I think a thousand people showed up that year. Um, and wow. talk about new products we build just like, you know, any other keynote. And so not only did you have a keynote there, but there's another picture where you're doing a fireside chat, which is kind of fun as well. Let's see if I can share that, if I can get through that. Um, so like even that planning for that though is incredible. Um, who did, who would do that? A marketing team. And at that point, how big were you all? Let's see if I can share this here. 2018, this is June, 2018. We would have probably been about 400 people. Wow. And there you were talking with, uh, I think this is an investor. Is that possible? Yeah, that's, um, one of the heads of Sequoia Capital, um, Doug Leone, who was on our board. So I guess that, that uh, brings me a different question. You all had started selling within three months or, or within six months of being at uh, Y Combinator, you were already selling. Why did you have to also, I, I'm assuming, yeah, actually I think you raised uh, 60 or 70 million. Why did you uh, go out and start raising with VCs? Uh, yes, so we took a seed round in 2012 after Y Combinator. Um, that was so we could start paying ourselves and hiring some more people to help out with growth. And then our Series A was led by Sequoia, and that was done in 2014. So time went by. Um, we were about four million in ARR annual recurring revenue at the time, and like people notice, other incumbents notice, and it's like we had copycats on the market and it was very clear to me that we needed to go out to market faster, that most of our customers in 2014 were in San Francisco Bay area because that's where the founders were based. And um, I, think, I think for for the founders, we thought that we could have this like really nice lifestyle business where we would keep running Plan Group forever without adding a, a venture capitalist to our board. Um, but in SaaS and soft, software as a service, there are only one big winner and then a, a, a number two that maybe has 20% of market share and then everyone else waiting to die a slow death or fast death. Yeah. And that the, the winner in a vertical 
SaaS um, company is usually like they have 60, 70, 80% of market share. And so that's what we realized in 2014. And it was clear that we needed to run faster. And so we knew we needed to build a sales team. We knew we needed to scale our business. We knew we needed capital. And that's why we, we partnered with Sequoia. Um, Guillermo uh, Gonzalez has an interesting question here. I'm wondering how, how was your experience working with possibly the greatest VC in the world? <laughs> what does a VC like that bring to the, to a company like plan grid? Um, Doug, Doug would be very happy to hear that. He wouldn't admit it. Um, you know, he's just, he's been an operator before. He's been on many boards. He's seen many businesses fail. He's seen many businesses survive and thrive. And I think there's just a, a certain amount of patterns that he's seen that is applicable to most businesses. So getting his advice there was really important. Um, getting coached by him, especially during the negotiations with, with Autodesk and um, just getting his advice over the years was incredibly valuable to me. So can you talk a little bit about how things evolved um, to Autodesk? How did that come about and, and what was that like? Yeah, um, companies are bought, they are not sold. Um, and usually a company like Autodesk purchases startups for one or a few reasons. One being the technology, which was true in our case. Two, for revenue, so they could beef up their books in a certain business unit, which was also in our case. And then three, four, for the team. And I guess the fourth one, actually a, a really important factor would be for their market position in that certain industry. So Autodesk saw a CEO change, I think in 2017, and he had put his stake in the ground and said, we are going to dominate construction um, because Autodesk for the last 40 years has been the leaders in design software and it's crazy, but PlanGrid stores, everything, like everything PlanGrid stores was created by Autodesk design software. So the technical synergies was very obvious um, to everyone, um, to our customers certainly. And I think we just got to a certain size of revenue where we really got their attention. And I'm sure they were evaluating our competitors as well, but it, it just made sense. Uh, the negotiations took a long time. Um, I literally grew a child and gave birth <laughs> during that time. And um, that's how it happened. Um, well, it sounds so simplistic in a way, but so it sounds like they need to find you. You don't find them. Yeah, I think so. And how does that work? Do they just call one day and say, hey, <laughs> or meet someone for coffee? I a call from the CEO one day <laughs> to meet up. And that was after, uh, oh, interesting. And, and so wow, what was that conversation like? How do you hold yourself? How do you, like, are you excited or do you? Oh, we had so many awkward conversations. Um, so many awkward conversations. You know, I think, I think what I learned from that experience and actually just, just in, in terms of like even doing deals with our customers and other vendors over the years, it's like deals are made to fall through. I mean, our, our deal with Autodesk fell through for many reasons on our end, as well as on their end, five times. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable, but that's just how deals work. Um, it, is like, it is like a law that they fall through. And eventually we, we got to a point where it just made sense. Um, we'd been talking for so long. We had been tugging this rope for so long. It just made sense for us to, to join together because at the end of the day, um, we wanted to do the exact same thing. We wanted to build great software for an industry that needed it. And when we looked at our roadmaps, we had identical roadmaps and we would just be much more powerful as, as like one unit versus competing against each other. Um, I don't, I know that auto um, desk has, has bought different companies, but I actually did not do this research. Um, sorry, forgive me, but I am curious. Um, are, is plan grid like the most expensive acquisition Autogrid has had or in the top three? Autodesk, excuse me. Autogrid's a really good name. Um, I know, I keep, I keep doing that. I'm like, maybe they should call themselves Autogrid. Um, yes, it, uh, yes. 
it's the largest acquisition Autodesk has made to date. So you are really solid and relaxed and you seem almost unflappable, but I cannot imagine that with what you have gone through that you are unflappable. Can you give it like, are, were there times as you were building the company or it was being acquired or one of the five times that the acquisition fell through that you were like throwing up your hands and that was it. Any like low points or particular. Oh, high God. So many low points. Um, it's, it's the funny thing about being like a first time founder CEO is that if you have any success at all, you're literally in the largest job, the biggest job you've ever been in. And so how does that work? It means that making a lot of mistakes. It means that I have very insecure thoughts all the time about whether I'm the right person to do it. Um, and I think the reason we were able to scale is just, I made sure to surround myself with people who had done it before. And I really listened and I, you know, I listened, but I also made the decisions. I made the best decision that I could for plan grid at that time. Um, that was the only way it worked was because we had a team that had done it before. So you say listen, and listening is actually quite hard. Is there any technique that you use to make sure that you're listening? Yes, it's, it's like, it's so easy for us to have our hearts split in so many directions, especially when there's, there's just not enough people to do the work or just because life happens and it's really easy for us to be distracted. Actually, when I, when I even speak over a webinar to people, I just assume that within minute two that I've lost half of them. <laughs> They're just Actually, you've me. gained an extra 100 if that helps, but yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think at least half of you are thinking about, I don't know, depending on what time it is, like what you're going to have for a snack later or who you're, who you're going to text, um, who you're waiting to be text back from. Um, what was your question? I'm just babbling right now. No, no, I'm just wondering if you have any techniques, anything. Oh, I'm listening. To help listen. <laughs> well, listen to your question. Um, and, so, and so I think it's really, really important to just like be here in the moment and it takes practice. I mean, it, I still suck at it. Um, if I'm asking someone for help, yeah, I'm going to be there and make sure that I'm not just there with my heart split thinking about something else. I'm really there. It just makes things easier also. So we have an interesting question from Soledad. Um, uh, I think this is interesting because we're using Zoom and my understanding is that Zoom was uh, created by somebody who worked on WebEx for Cisco and everything that he hated about WebEx from Cisco, he changed and used it for Zoom. And so this is kind of a similar question. When you're creating plan grid, did you have times when you thought you could not build the platform you wanted to? And if so, what did you do? Um, like, did I have expectations on what we wanted to build and then it wasn't happening? Yeah. Or you couldn't do it for some reason, or even when you're with Autodesk, uh, uh, yeah, Autodesk that they were like, nah, we can't go this way. Oh, so many times. And it's either, either we never, it's like, it's always a factor. We don't have enough people to do all the things you, you know, we need to do, or you want us to do. Um, if you were, so we talked about being flappable or unflappable and, and, um, I actually wanted to, uh, take a little poll really quickly at this point, because we're going to kind of go into a, a summary in a minute, but we talked about uh, a little bit about that you're fairly unflappable. And I want to ask you in a minute what you do to kind of, to de-stress because you also are a mother of, um, you will be a mother soon of two children under the age of four. Is that right? Yes. Um, you've started this company. Uh, I believe you also recently started doing um, more with, with Y Combinator again. Um, so I just want to put a pin in that for a second. And I'm going to quickly do a poll of our students. And I'm kind of wondering uh, what they do to de-stress. And uh, I'm just kind of curious. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I have like walking, rigorous exercise, meditation, yoga, FaceTime, Zoom, WhatsApp, reading or writing or other. 
so let's see where we are. Uh, probably about half the people have uh, <laughs> completed the poll. Um, because you're so good at seeing the future, Tracy, any things that you would imagine that uh, come up? I don't think you can see the poll, can you? I can see the poll. I just can't vote. Oh, shoot. Never mind then. I can't ask you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. But it seems like rigorous exercise. Uh, and um, I'm going to share the results. Rigorous exercise kind of wins. Um, I put kickboxing in there because I heard somebody was doing kickboxing recently, jogging, biking. What do you do to keep things balanced and yourself in, and things in perspective? Oh, I, I try to hike. I'm, I'm very lucky to spend most of my time in the Bay Area or Marin. And so there's a lot of beautiful hikes out here. Um, between that and just listening to music, marathoning, Lord of the Rings, which I'm doing right now. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so just switching over a little bit, thinking about the students. Um, uh, I, one question that I had for you, you started working with Y Combinator again uh, recently with Michael Seibel. Uh, I, I don't know when it started. Was it late last year or middle of last year? Yeah, I um, helped with one or 20. So that includes application reading and interviews. We started in October. Um, so it's kind of a scary time right now um, with these entrepreneurs who are coming in at a time, I, I don't know, I think demo day, maybe it's soon. Um, any, any as, as people also in the audience are thinking about starting new ventures and with the things that are going on right now, any thoughts on what to um, think about as people might be launching in a really challenging market? Yeah, I mean, we we started Planger during a downturn. And, you know, I think we're proof that you can do it. I think one of the things we did right early on was we kept our personal cash burn really low. Um, we were lucky that all of us had been working for a few years and we were incredibly cheap. And so we could survive. We sort of looked at our account. When we realized we could build Planger into a business, um, we knew we had 18 months of runway. And part of that was because we were, we were like living at one of the parents' houses. <laughs> so um, that keeps costs down. Um, so I would, I would advise all of you to think about, and it should be easy, you're all starving students right now, to keep your personal cash burn low. Beans and rice is really cheap. Um, and then just to build. Build something that is worthy of your time. Build something that you care about. The only reason Plangrid worked. Plangrid should have died 10 times over the last eight years. The only reason it worked was because we loved it. And in the moments where it was like, we were just a hairline away from just dying as a startup, we just willed it back into existence. And we just brute force manhandled and woman handled it back to life. And the only way that works is if it's something you really care about. And by the way, if you have any success at all, you're going to be doing this for at least a decade. So going back and, and trying to think, I, I imagine you've been asked this question a lot. So um, feel free to use an answer you've used or come up with something new. If you had to give your 20 year old self uh, some pieces of advice, uh, what do you wish you'd known or what were you happy that you did know? We had something incredibly tragic happen to Planger and in, in the early years. Um, our co-founder Antoine, you saw earlier, he passed of cancer at 29 years old in 2012. So we're, we're just barely getting the company started and, and our best friend dies of cancer. Totally unfair. It's 29 years old, what the fuck? Um, and so you can imagine how traumatic it was for us um, one of the last conversations I had with him, and I was, gosh, I must have been like 25, 26 at the time. Um, he said, life is short. Take care of the ones you love. Don't be afraid to try new things. And never, ever do anything that makes you unhappy. 
that was our last conversation together. And it's something I think about every single day. And um, if only I knew that at 20, I would have spent those years much differently, but I'm very thankful. I mean, obviously I wish my best friend was still alive, but there's a balance to every bad thing that happens. And I think the good side of it was we, we realized that, gosh, this could all be taken away from us at any given point in time. And so, gosh, do we have to make sure that what we are doing is worth it? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. That hits close to home. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I now uh, kind of wanted to open it up to uh, different questions from the audience and I'm, I'm pulling up the Q and a uh, right now. Um, one of them from anonymous was when your team had differing preferences and ways to approach certain things, how did you guys resolve it? Oh, that's, that's really hard. We would argue, we fought so much. We would yell like just really painful arguments. Um, and I think that's, that's normal for founders. I think as long as like, we, we know how to forgive each other, you know, afterwards, I think that's the only way we survived as founders. Um, and as, as still as friends today that give enough time and give enough problems and obstacles that you face together most likely even if you're like totally aligned and on the same page you're going to argue about something and like we are not we are not that argument that our friendship and our partnership is much more than just a bad argument um but how did we how do we come to decisions um gosh we would argue over pixels <laughs> for hours back then um, again, a cl clear delineation of responsibilities is nice here. And then eventually you get to a certain size where there is a CEO and there you go. It's the final decision. If you can't, can't argue it and there's no clear, like clear winning argument, then the CEO just makes a decision and move on. And, and I, I apologize, but who was the clear CEO for you all? Uh, so I, I ran Pine Grid as CEO for the last eight years. So it was, it, you were, you were the, the buck stopped with you. What, um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, looking through these Q and A's, uh, also, and pe people feel free to raise your hands. I, I saw that somebody didn't mean to raise their hand, um, uh, which I kind of thought that was amusing. Uh, especially, uh, there's a person who, who was concerned that things are becoming a little bit monotonous. So, uh, Guyanandra, please feel free to raise your hand, ask a question. Um, and let me see if I'm looking at this, uh, I'm looking at the chat, Tracy, if you see anything, uh, that you like, uh, haha, -ha. how do you know when, uh, this is Daniel Khan. How did you know when you had the right team going in? How did you know that you had? The right team going in um i don't think we had a choice so we we knew we wanted to build something together we knew we liked spending time together um and that was as good good as it got uh we wanted to all quit our jobs and build pine together and oh. then the first 10 hires um I mean, you have to understand we had nothing at that point. So why would anyone join Plan Grid? We were just this little shit startup um, with very young leaders who didn't know what we were doing. And so the only people that would work for us were people who were not in tech or people who had just graduated from college and could not find a job. Um, and so what did we look for? We looked for people who wanted to learn, who were problem solvers and who had like a good attitude. Other people, Ryan would say, we, we want to, like, if I had to get, be stuck on a train with them, like, I would rather be stuck with this person than that person. What, what, kind, of, um, what kind of questions do you ask when you're hiring that, that are anything different than what normal every, everybody asks? Uh, some of my favorite questions are, let's see, it, it depends, and they've changed over the years. So early on, um, we're sort of looking for, generalists, people who will just be open to doing anything and learning anything and just helping out wherever the company needed 
help on because we needed everyone to make themselves into 10 person to make, make the startup work. Um, then we get to about a hundred people and suddenly like generalists don't work. We need specialists. We need everyone in charge of one thing or else it's complete chaos. Um, so the questions would be different, but one of my favorite questions is just like, just getting to know the person. Um, and it's like, what do you do if you have an extra two hours on a Sunday, what are you doing? And this usually um, helps me sort of understand what they care about in life or what they're, what they're passionate about. And I think that matters to me. That's a great question. Um, a lot of students are thinking about jobs and thinking what to do. And Sheena uh, asks any advice for a current civil engineering major deciding what to specialize on? Thoughts on grad school? Question mark. I didn't go to grad school, so I don't know if I can give any advice there. Um, just depends on what moves you. Uh, do you want to build bridges? Do you want to do calcs on dirt work? Do you want to design high rises? It's just what what calls to your heart. Probably follow that. Um, and so you, as somebody, uh, Henry Jim uh, also Jen also asks about grad school. Did you ever think about it? Yeah, I think I took the GREs at some point. Um, I did mostly because I didn't want to work anymore, and then I ended up building Planker instead. <laughs> um, so some very specific questions. Um, oh, here. You were talking about yourself feeling insecure, which is somewhat hard to imagine talking with you, but I get it. Um, Anonymous asks, who's feeling a little scared themselves, uh, how do you battle fears of not being capable or smart enough to do something? you're you're a cal student right like in terms of intelligence you're probably better than at least 90 percent of the population i think i think that gosh this is another thing i wish i could tell my like 20 year old self is like in in all your flaws i am the most perfect version of myself that there is no no better perfect version of tracy there could be with all my flaws and everything, warts and all. Um, I think, I think, you know, a, a pep talk of just like, you're good enough just the way you are. And you know, some Alicia Key song, um, which sounds very trite and, but it's, it's so true that I think we, we are so hard on ourselves. And if you have a personality like mine's, I'm, I'm a bully to myself. Um, one thing I started doing was just sort of looking myself in the mirror every night and asking myself like, okay, how did you fuck up today? And then just sort of like download, okay, these are the things that I'm not happy about. I shouldn't have talked to this person that way. That was kind of mean. Um, I shouldn't have reacted that way. And it both gave me anxiety, but it also, it also just clarified the areas that I wanted to work on myself on. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. I'm still very insecure, believe it or not. And I think that's just part of the human condition. We have these expectations of ourselves and, and those ideas are all so, they're just made up stories that we want to be. And we're in this constant battle and this constant struggle of like, I'm here right now and I wanna be that. And it's, it's nauseating. And we forget that like, this is the only moment that we're actually guaranteed. And I think that's that's one of the wake up moments for me when when my best friend died, very young and very in a very unfair way. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, Cameron Kalantar wants to know, um, with your background at Y Combinator and hiring people over the last uh, almost ten years, and also being at Autodesk, um, what would you recommend to help? students stand out besides the fact that they went to Cal or possibly what type of in internships might make them stand out? Um, be really nice to the recruiters. The recruiters like are frontline filters for everything. Um, I would just have your selling shoes on at all times. That every interaction you have is, is going to be evaluated. Even your emails, 
um, responses, how fast you respond, et cetera. And then I would say that if you can say it in one word, say it in one word. Like if you are ever asked a question during an interview that's a yes or no question, like yes and no could be followed by a period. Um, and we're always looking for, for efficiencies in business and especially in a startup. And I think our ability to communicate succinctly is really important. Um, Anonymous asks, how is your experience as a woman at the helm of a company? Was there a time when your voice was not heard or ignored by men in the room? And I just want Anonymous to remember that one of those people in the company happens to be your partner right now. Yeah, gosh, like, I, I just think that aside from being very insecure as a species, <laughs> um, we're also incredibly judgmental. I know I judge the hell out of people. And so it's very easy to judge someone like me and how I look um, as a construction engineer, as a founder, CEO, as someone who's trying to negotiate a, you know, a very large deal. Um, the things that have been said to me over the years, it's like, I, you know, I, I think you're too, I think you're too small. I think you're too whatever to do that. Um, it's just a lot of really hurtful things. Um, I think what I remind myself is that like no one really wakes up in the morning, maybe some people, but it's a small population. Like no one really wants to wake up and say like, I'm just going to be an asshole to people today. And, and that when things are said or, or judgment happens, that it's actually our responsibility to call it out. Like, hey, when you say this to me, it really hurts my feelings. And actually, it's not cool. I hope you don't do that outside of this conversation, that it's actually our responsibility to, to give them a teaching moment. Um, it's either that or I ended up holding it for years and just feeling really bad and down on myself because of someone's, something someone said in passing. Um, the other thing I will say is that for a long time, I, I would go up on stage and, and get asked like, how does it feel to be you know, a, a woman CEO? And I would say something like, um, I actually don't wake up every morning thinking I'm, I'm a woman. You know, I just think about, what I have to do that day. And I don't think, I'm sure my experience is the same as, as a male's experience. And then, and then I got pregnant and then I gave birth and then I had a breastfeed and I thought to myself, wow, was I wrong? Because we are just biologically different. Um, I had a miscarriage uh, last year and like a man will never ever, it was incredibly sad for my, for my husband of course as well but he will never have to physically go through that, right? So we are just biologically different. Uh, what is my point here? Well, I think it's basically, it's a lot about how you feel about yourself, how you, how you handle criticism, uh, recognizing differences in, in people, um, things that people will or won't go through, how you be nicer to yourself. Then, yeah. Sorry, and I, that's not I, what the question I, was, but I'm thinking I think, you need to be nicer think, to yourself. Yeah, I, I think that there will come times where it's going to be hard to be like you in whatever setting. And I think there is, there's like two options, like feel bad and let someone put, put me down, or I can feel more powerful in that moment, whether I'm giving them a, lear a learning moment or realizing that, yeah, it is, it is kind of hard. <laughs> it is really hard to negotiate this deal with a huge belly because let's face it, like, I just saw five people in the room stare at my belly instead of looking at me in the eyes. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of very detailed questions um, on plan grid. And I want to ask you, I, I want you to answer that, but I, I, I guess I want to preface it by saying, um, I don't know if you can talk about it. What are your plans right now with plan grid? Um, gosh, is it a week ago? Uh, so I agreed to stay on for a little more than a year at Autodesk to integrate PlanGrid into the Autodesk construction business unit. And that's been done. So my duty is done and I have recently left Autodesk. So we've passed the torch over to our amazing team who's now part of Autodesk Construction. So I do have to ask you, what do you do when you have free time if you're not doing Autodesk? Well, right now, right now, I'm just like, feels like I'm vacuuming after a toddler all the time. 
I'm very domestic at the moment. Maybe you can come up with a better vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I don't think I'm the right person to design that. Dyson did a pretty good job. Um, do you, is Autogrid going to go international? One of the, um, that was one of the questions or uh, plans to go global? Yes. Um, and that was one of the reasons, plan grid, yes. that was one of the reasons we decided to join Autodesk as well. Um, we, we didn't know how to grow our business internationally. We were going to take some risky bets. And this is something that Autodesk has figured out. They sell their software worldwide and they can distribute plan grid to everywhere they do business. Um, that's great. Another question from Lewis Pack. This is from a while ago, but I think it's interesting. Plan grid now being with Autodesk has become a standard in the construction industry. However, there are over 5,000 construction startups and some are competitors of the same service as you provide. Currently, do you think that AEC players, this is someone who really knows his stuff, are being overwhelmed? Also, you are a founder who came in with extensive industry experience, but there are many current big name AEC startups that are not. Do you think this is an issue? Yeah, so my strong opinion and one of the reasons I decided to sell my company to, to a competitor really at the time in 2018 when the deal was done, one of the reasons I made the decision was because I was scared, because I had the strong opinion that the construction software market was consolidating. I think that there's still, of course, room for startups. Um, they're more nimble, they can move faster, they can build faster, they can make better deals uh, for customers. Um, but my strong opinion at our size at the time was that it would be an incredibly hard mountain to climb and it would be easier with Autodesk. And part of the reason is because we're going to just going to see an, uh, someone like an Autodesk just absorb a bunch of startups in the space. And Plangard was one of them. Interesting. Um, any thoughts also in terms of, I am curious to know, with PlanGrid, would there be, is there something about PlanGrid now that you would... Is there something, some piece that you can take of it from it and do something else with it? Or are, do you have handcuffed? Are you handcuffed that way? Or how do you leave something that you, something else that you gave birth to? Which is, sorry, not, not just your, your children, but also. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, I sold my company for money, right? For cash. Um, it was hard. I think, I think a part of me, God, I mean, it's still true. I can still feel it. Like a part of me would have loved to build Plangrid standalone and like Tracy can stay queen of Plangrid forever. <laughs> but it wasn't the right decision. I would have done that for my own ego. Um, it wasn't the right decision, especially with this pandemic happening. It, it seems more like every day it was the right decision. Um, it's, it's hard. And so I, I had to maximize all options for, for plan grid, include, including a series C fundraise. Um, and I had to choose the best path for our company, for our customers and for our team. So it wasn't an easy decision. You've put so much into it. I'm, I am, uh, I have one question uh, left that we're going to go through and that's about the company culture at plan grid. And then, the company culture within Autodesk. Can you talk about culture a little bit and and what part that played as you were scaling and building the company? Yeah, I think that we we had we definitely like had a personality at Plan Grid. Um, we're sort of known in the industry as. It's funny because the construction industry calls us the sweethearts, which I've always hated, but I think there's a lot of truth. People for the, and, and for, for our customers and for the families of people who had worked for us. Um, and so I think, I mean, I think you guys have been listening to me talk for the last hour 
and like even the way I communicate affects the culture and then everyone that comes in affects the culture as well it's dynamic but I think at the core we are we were just like humble hard-working builders that's who we were um, not that that's not odd at us also it's just different um, it's hard to explain but one of the reasons why I'm not at Autodesk is because it was like I landed on the moon. It was a complete culture clash for, for me personally. Um, what made me a great founder for a company like PlanGrid made me a totally terrible employee for a 10,000 person public company. Um, we were just not right for each other. And it wasn't because there were bad people. There were like super nice people. They're as nice as, as they get. Interesting. I, uh, if you had to, if you had the option of going back and changing anything, is there anything that you would do any differently? Um, gosh, it's hard. It's hard. It's so hard to play that question in my head because I, I am happy with the outcome. Like Autodesk took care of me. They took care of our team the technology is in a great place. We now get access to Autodesk technology, which brings design into construction in the field faster. And so in a lot of ways, it's like, I'm really happy about how everything happened. Um, of course, there's like a ton of mistakes that we've made over the years. That I wish I didn't mistake and didn't make. And it always has to do with people. I think we never, you hear this often um, as like founder advice. It's like, fire people fast, but it's never fast enough. So maybe that's what I would do differently. Um, I cannot thank you enough for being so candid and so honest uh, with us this evening. There are still a couple of questions. Um, uh, one thing that we do do um, is uh, we have a passcode because we ask um, all the students for feedback, uh, which I, I'm, I'm it's all very positive. So when you're standing in front of that mirror and you're talking about what you might have fucked up today, I just want you to know this was incredible. And I know that the students will give uh, their feedback and, and you can see that too. Um, and I just want to say thank you. And I'm going to try to see if I can make this work. Let's see, just a minute. That would be applause. So thank you so very much. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. I mean, it's like an hour of your time. Thanks for listening to me. Um, and, and if you have uh, extra questions for Tracy, we'll go over the Q&A. Um, there are a couple of questions that weren't answered or only partially answered. Um, we can look over that too. I wish uh, all the students a good evening. Stay healthy. And interestingly enough, when I talked to Tracy uh, last week, she mentioned that she was partnering with Michael Seibel at, at Y Combinator. And it reminded me we hadn't heard from Michael in a while. And so Michael Seibel will be joining us next Tuesday talking about his work with uh, Twitch, Justin TV and, and uh, Y Combinator. So Tracy, thank you. Good luck with everything. And uh, I hope that you'll still join us again in the future. It's been fun to listen to you. AV, thank you very much for the introduction. Absolutely. It was okay. a an honor introducing you, Tracy. Stay safe, all of you guys. Take care. Bye.